I wish to warmly welcome you to our webinar with a long title, Face Surveillance versus Facial Authentication. What is it? And why should biometric mass surveillance be banned in the public space? My name is Tineke Strick. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Greens, AFA group, and I'm a member of this LIBE committee in about uh, civil liberty, security and justice, co-coordinator for the Greens. But this is a common uh, action, uh, this webinar, because it's part of the Greens EFA campaign for a ban on biometric mass surveillance in public spaces. A growing number of governments are experimenting with facial recognition in public spaces. And we, as a Greens and EFA, we think it's essential to raise awareness among the citizens of this, this trend of the use of biometric uh, surveillance, but specifically also on the risk that it poses to our rights of privacy, democracy and non-discrimination. Raising awareness, of course, also requires to be informed on what it is, how it works. For instance, the differences between facial identification recognition techniques and but also, of course, on the dangers that it's imposing. And therefore, we organized this event to discuss this uh, uh, more in depth uh, with experts and NGOs. And we're very uh, grateful for their participation. If you are tracked or identified in the public space without any awareness, this increases the power of imbalances between the state and the citizens. And this can, of course, have huge consequences for the rule of law in our countries. The fact that we simply don't know when, where and why we are surveyed means that we cannot exercise any democratic or judicial control on the use of it. We cannot undertake any actions or have access to justice because it's just we're just subject to certain actions. And if you compare it to um, to techniques we are more uh, you know familiar with, it's a bit a funny difference because if enforcement authorities, for instance, would all of a sudden start to ask uh, at any single moment and person on the street for an identification document, we would find it completely disproportionate and unacceptable. But this is actually what is happening now in the virtual world. The use of facial recognition in the public space entails also the risk of misidentifying innocent citizens as criminals. And it's also likely to amplify existing inequalities and leading to a systematic racism. And therefore we need to know how this works in order to understand how big this risk actually is in daily practice. And I think it's also good that we address during this webinar uh, the Pandora's box, because if we start using this facial record, uh, surveillance, where does it stop? Even if authorities promise to have safeguards in place and only use it for specific goals, for example, to fight terrorism, you still need to hang up surveillance cameras on every corner of the street. And once this information is gathered, how can we be sure that it's not going to be used in other ways? Uh, we, you, we have so many examples of what we uh, uh, mentioned, function creep. Once authorities do possess uh, information, it's very seducive in practice to use it also for other purposes. And of course, we have a lot of rights in place. We have our Charter of Fundamental Rights, and we also have a very young regulation in the EU, the GDPR, on the right to data protection. And one of the first criteria that is always necessary to assess is, is the use, are specific measures interfering with our right to privacy, are they necessary? And this is also something, of course, we need to ask ourselves for facial recognition in the public space. Is it really necessary or maybe it even be counterproductive as it may distract the authorities from effective investigations and law enforcement? But besides that, I think we also need to discuss and think through in what kind of society we want to live. A society where every person is tracked, profiled and judged by the government on the basis of facial characteristics that is not exactly the society that we as the Greens envisage. So what can we do about it? 
how can we bring these concerns further? We need an EU-wide discussion on what the use of facial recognition means for our societies, including how it amplifies existing inequalities, inequalities and whether it fits with our conceptions of democracy, freedom, privacy and equality. And when it became clear that the Commission wanted to set rules, impose rules for the Member States on the use of facial recognition, the Member States really became in a resistant mode. They did not want to have any interference, any restriction from their policies uh, that they were actually at the moment exploring and, and increasingly using. So therefore, it's so important that we as a European Parliament speak up proactively so in order not to be too late once those policies have further developed and that the resistance from the member states even becomes bigger so we need to uh, act now and we need to act with one voice and only uh, uh, we, we we need to raise awareness in our societies of these developments and to uh, have also resistance from the citizens from societies themselves in order to align up uh, with members of parliament. I think only then we can put member states under pressure. A ban on facial recognition in the public space is feasible and it is perfectly possible. And I think it's very good in therefore to get some inspiration from abroad uh, because uh, there are very clear positive examples. For instance, great progress has been made in the US, Portland Oregon, Oregon, Boston and San Francisco are among the cities that really effectively have banned uh, biometric surveillance by law enforcement authorities. So I think that now the time is for the EU to step up and follow that example. The Greens IFA ban biometrics campaign will focus on, on the one hand, raising awareness and sparking the discussion within the parliament and outside the parliament with events and by also working on studies on where and to what extent facial surveillance is already used and what its impact is on fundamental rights. I think this, is, this information is really important to, well, to have our arguments in place, but also to show uh, the risks of the effective uh, use of it. And I think um, it is also good if you keep in touch for our video release on Data Protection Day. And uh, of course, this webinar, this discussion uh, will hopefully also contribute to, for us, ideas on how to bring this discussion further, but also on the strategies, uh, how we can cooperate in order to uh, increase the pressure uh, for this uh, ban. So, um, I wish you a very inspiring uh, debate, uh, webinar, and uh, I would like to give the floor now to my colleague, Kim van Sparatak, who will welcome our speakers and moderate the panel discussion. Thank you very much and have a great webinar. Thank you so much, Tineke, for this great introduction. Uh, so my name is Kim van Sparatak. I'm a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands, also for the Greens EFA group. And I'm very excited to be here today and we'll moderate the conversation together with our fantastic experts on facial recognition, biometrics and artificial intelligence. I completely agree with Tineke that we do not want a society in which people are automatically judged and classified based on their appearances. Judging people on their facial features inherently entails a huge risk of racism. These are risks we are not willing to take. And this is something we have to keep on challenging. Moreover, bias and false positives can have far-reaching consequences. It is important to spark an EU-wide discussion about this. And uh, these are the things that we will be discussing today. So um, we are very honored that Irina Orsic is joining us today. Um, Irina Orsic is a team leader for AI policy in the AI policy development and coordination at the European Commission. Welcome so, so much, Irina, to be one of our panelists. Then we have from the Netherlands, Lotte Houwing, a policy advisor and researcher at Bits of Freedom. She focuses primarily on the relationship between the state and its citizens and the power relations that accompany it. 
Bits of Freedom is a digital rights organization in the Netherlands focusing on privacy and freedom of communication online. Welcome, Lotte. Thank you, Kim. And from Berlin, joining us is Dr. Nakima Steffelbauer, who founded and runs the Frauenloop, a women's programming nonprofit in Berlin, and the growing Technicolor.eu community of tech leaders in Europe. Oh, tech in color, sorry. It's a wordplay and I played it. Uh, Dr. Stemmelbauer's work focused on the impact of artificial intelligence adoption on marginalized communities. Welcome, Dr. Stemmelbauer. Thank you. And joining us from Canada, uh, we have Deborah Raji. She's a Mozilla fellow specialized in algorithmic auditing. She works closely with the Algorithmic Justice League initiative to highlight bias in deployed AI products. She was named the Forbes 30 Under 30 and MIT Tech Review 35 Under 35 Innovators. Welcome, Deb. And from Belgrade, joining us is Simon Ilse, the, dir the director from the Heinrich Bull Stiftung, uh, the office in Belgrade, Serbia, Montenegro and Kosovo. Simon will be, be explaining to us what is and has been happening in Serbia with the introduction of biometric surveillance with thousands of cameras throughout the capital. Thank you so much. So uh, first of all, I um, we hope to make this uh, conversation open to you all who are watching. Um, our viewers can take part by putting questions in the chat on YouTube, and we will collect and forward them to our speakers during the Q&A session later on. So without further ado, let's begin with addressing the differences between facial recognition and authentication technology. Facial recognition technologies are already being implemented in public spaces. A chilling example of the use of biometric surveillance is the city of Belgrade. So first of all, I would like to give the floor to Simon Ilse from the Heinrich Boll Foundation. Simon, could you perhaps explain and walk us through what is currently happening in Serbia and how is facial surveillance being used and what are the consequences? Yes, thank you, Kim. Thanks a lot. For inviting me and uh, thanks to the Greens in the European Parliament. I think it's very good that you um, raise awareness of, uh, on this topic and that gives a lot of hope also in the region where I work in the Western Balkans, um, Serbia, Montenegro and Kosovo and the countries where my office is active. Um, I'm just going to say um, from the start that I'm representing here uh, by far and large info that has been um, brought to us by our partner organization, which is the SHARE Foundation based in Belgrade, which is doing very important and relevant work on the use of biometric surveillance technologies uh, in the city of Belgrade. And basically what we have been seeing and, and witnessing since 2019, more or less, is um, a Huawei project um, that's called the Safer City Project being rolled out in the city of Belgrade with the plan to roll out um, a camera, biometric camera surveillance system of more than 1,000 cameras being deployed all over, all over the city. This is a, um, as you can imagine, directly bilaterally negotiated um, project between the governments of China and uh, Serbia. And it's being, um, it's being installed and it's being deployed um, without much transparency, without um, much um, reasoning for why this would be necess necessary or proportionate. Um, so just to give you a few uh, points on, on what we're facing, uh, basically Minister of Interior back then, Mr. Stefanovic, was quoted saying that there will be no significant streets, entrances or passages between buildings that will not be covered by cameras. We will know from which entrance and building the perpetrator came from which car. Um, yes, and so on. And, uh, and this is basically gives you um, a bit of an idea of, of what, they're, uh, what they're aiming for. Um, after the SHARE Foundation, um, an NGO based in, in, in Serbia, which is also part, by the way, of the EDRI um, um, Society Network, uh, published information on this project to a way removed any information from their website on the Safer City uh, project in Belgrade. Um, this camera systems of, of what we know so far from the from analyzing what kind of cameras are being deployed is highly invasive it analyzes up to 10 plus body and face attributes 
and it is being deployed, um, as I said before, in, in on, on poles, in public spaces, on major uh, traffic crossings, but, but mostly public spaces actually everywhere in the city center of Belgrade and New Belgrade. Um, so the, the argument that is being put forward by the government so far that it's, it is for crime prevention or traffic users is very little um, convincing since uh, these cameras are definitely pointing to all kinds of directions and are, and are, are deployed in a way that, that, um, that allows for indiscriminate surveillance basically of the population. Um, the, interestingly enough, the Commission on Freedom of Information um, in Serbia, uh, which is one um, state um, uh, institution, s says himself that there's no legal basis in Serbia to use biometric surveillance, that the law on personal data protection is silent on such technology, and that the principles of necessity and proportionality are not met. Um, we are very worried about this uh, development, of course, because we think that Belgrade could be a first precedent in Europe uh, for, for, such, for such technology, the first European city to use it on a massive scale. Um, and it, as such, is a bit of a battleground um, then for, for, for the usage and for the, the fight also against such technologies. Um, as I said, we don't have any uh, information um, on the system in detail by the government, all information uh, freedom of information requests put forward by civil society were denied. There's still a um, a process pending with um, with the commissioner of freedom of information, so that uh, is still pending. And um, basically, the sole rollout comes um, in a in a larger flat frame of actually Serbia trying to present itself as a digital um, front runner. Uh, there's a big digital uh, digitalization agenda by the um, Bernabic uh, government um, since a couple of years, I would say 2015, uh, more or less, and um, and it's being basically, yeah, um, it's being advertised as something um, in this uh, as something modern and in this uh, realm of of digitalization of the society and as 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 a modern progressive um, um, way forward. Um, all of this comes also against the background of general data transparency problems. We see this with COVID statistics at the moment. There's a lot of doubt about um, how accurate the numbers are in the state databases. Um, there's, um, there's also, of course, a, um, a history in, um, um, in, in former Yugoslavia, but also in, uh, in, in, the, in the 90s, especially in, um, during the breakup of um, mass uh, policing of the of the society and and surveillance um and there's an issue definitely also with banking data which is more and more um actually coming to the forefront now that um that banks have um massive amounts of data on on um, uh, private data on on people and that they are also not hesitating apparently to share it with government officials or, or even the press um, I just want to, I just think that this example of Serbia and Belgrade is quite important because it's, it's a rather small country um, it, it's about five to six million inhabitants and Belgrade is, um, as the capital, it's one third roughly of that population. And you can imagine that, you know, people know each other, families know each other and, and um, especially in a, in a country where the state is such a dominant actor in, in the economy, people are... Um, already quite hesitant to be seen um, being to be seen being critical of the government in protests, for example, in the public space. So uh, imagine uh, there would be um, now a full, uh, um, actively used rollout of these cameras. Um, uh, how many people would still be willing to actually share their protest or their critique of any of any government um, uh, policies? Um, I'm I. I was uh, I was a bit announced as being as you know reporting from a, a context where it's already happening and where everything is already surveilled. We don't know that for a fact. We I mean we can see the cameras um, everywhere. Um, we know that they're being deployed. They're they're connected and everything. But we don't know to what extent they're already used and to what extent that data is already analyzed and and collected. Um, probably yes, but we we don't know that for a fact since since it's very opaque. Also. Um, 
uh, we know that the servers and the let's, let's say digital infrastructure on that uh, on the back end is in the hands of the Ministry of Interior. Um, that the legal basis is lacking definitely for 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 processing such data, um, but that also Huawei um, would won't be the only um, service provider that would be able to maintain such a system um, and and further develop it. So that is also definitely a de dependency issue. So um, this is the problem basically. And uh, just to give you a short uh, also input on uh, what's being done to address this problem, um, Share Foundation, as I said before, has has been um, initiating a, a campaign which is called uh, Hilia de Camera. So 1,000 cameras. Um, in, this is part also of the EDRI European Digital Rights Network campaign um, to ban biometric um, mass surveillance. Um, over 6,000 people only from Serbia signed a petition, um, signed the European petition Reclaim Your Face, which was launched last year. Um, and uh, SHARE has been even crowdfunding 10,000 euros for a project addressing biometric surveillance in, uh, in Serbia. Um, a part of, of course, um, other corporations with us and with others to to um, to work on the topic. Um, Tineke mentioned in her introduction that it's important to to actually really make um, to to educate um, societies on these issues, and that's exactly what Share is also doing. They're doing um, basically technical tech workshops with uh, young people to um, to understand the technology. To, to discuss privacy and, and data protection and to also um, as a very practical um, game almost um, is to map the, the different cameras. So whenever there's a new camera, uh, somebody can um, somebody can go and, and map it on an open, um, open data um, platform. And so far um, over 1000 camera spots have been have been mapped in Belgrade. Um, I can share the, the links to that uh, later if you want. So so um, yeah, it's seen in, in Serbia as a very, I mean, among among our partners as a very positive um, development that the EU um, Commission registered the European Citizens Initiative um, for a ban on biometric mass surveillance. And um, even though, of course, Serbia is not yet part of the European Union, but they're, of course, supporting this campaign and hope that it will go through and that, um, that the European Union will set a positive example on this. Um, and yeah, basically their, their argument is, is always also to say um, we have to ban this. this guy. I mean, there's no way in, in improving this kind of technology the way it is being deployed right now. Uh, we have to ban this kind of um, camera technologies from public spaces because you just can't um, control what's, what's, um, happen, what's happened to these, uh, what will happen to these data. So this is uh, as an introduction. Thanks. Hope I wasn't too long. Thank you, Simon. Um, I don't think it was too long, and uh, it uh, it doesn't sound good, um, <laughs> to be honest. Um, no. I think it's a, it's a pretty haunting and, and scary uh, implementation, um, especially also because you actually have no idea whether it is already being used or not. Um, just one one question: Do do you have the feeling that that people are are very aware of the fact that they may be surveyed? And do you think it, it actually has an impact on people's behavior already? Well, it's a, it's a bit hard to say because we don't have, um, you know, um, survey data on that, for example, um, would be an interesting exercise to do it. But uh, um, I would say the general awareness in the population is very low. Um, people don't know. Um, I mean, the campaign has been ongoing, but, but uh, I would say it, it stays in a in a bubble of maybe 20 to 30,000 people in, in Belgrade and Serbia, maybe a bit more, but uh, other than that, people are uh, not uh, so aware and would probably say, um, oh yeah, these cameras, I mean, CCTV, this is what's happened already in London and uh, other European capitals for a long time. This is also coming to Belgrade now, nothing else to worry about. Um, this is some reactions that I had. Um, other than that, I would say, it, I mean, it's hard to say if people are already self-censoring themselves, already adapting their behavior. Uh, of course, that is that is the big fear and the big worry there. Um, we, I have heard, I've heard definitely testimonies of uh, from the last mass protests uh, last summer and and uh, before that in the winter, uh, the one out of five million protests where 
people were already saying, um, you know, uh, I would I would love to protest. I, I'm against this government, but I'm not going because I have government contracts um, with my company or with my um, organization. You know, so there's um, there's already that um, that level of of hesitation. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, for giving this uh, introduction. Welcome. Um, then uh, we'll move to uh, to the next topic that we have on our agenda today. Um, so the differences between facial recognition and facial authentication. Uh, many people, when they think of facial recognition, they think perhaps of unlocking their phone with their faces or going through an automated passport gate. But what people don't immediately think of is being identified by governments on the streets or in a crowd. So first we'll discuss the difference between these technologies, both in technology, degree of consent and consequences. So first I would like to ask a question to Deb. Um, you're an engineer and an absolute expert on AI and facial recognition systems. Um, would you like to explain to us in which ways unlocking your phone with your face is different to being recognized by facial recognition cameras on the streets? Are there technological differences and are there differences in the degree of accountability? Oh, and I think you're still muted. <laughs> Thanks. It's still happening in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, technology. Um, yeah, I think there's there's definitely there's there's certain clear um, differences between um, technically how um, a facial identification problem is approached versus a facial recognition problem. So, um, like you mentioned, um, you know, face identification the 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 goal is really or the application is often that of access. So, um, for example, um, you know, I need to get access into a government building or my apartment, or I need to get access into my phone, or um, uh, you know, I need to get access uh, into a particular device. So that's that's usually the application um, that we we think about for face identification, or I need to confirm my identity for the sake of you know getting access into a country to confirm that my face is on my passport um and um in those cases uh functionally the way that works is really um trying to think of a good you know a, a way to represent the pixels of your face from two different images of your face so um that question uh or that technical question um ends up becoming a little bit less invasive than something like facial recognition so the face identification problem is a one-to-one -one problem where I have one image of a person that I'm trying to understand, and then I have another image of you know an individual's face. And usually, um, there's some level of interaction involved. So you know I'm there when you're taking a picture of my face to compare it to the picture of my passport. Um, whereas with something like facial recognition, there's very little interaction involved. It's a one-to-many problem where you know the police might have a database of a bunch of faces. Um, and you know they acquire an image of your face, and they're trying to identify you know if you're within their database, um, or you're you know walking down the street and an image is captured of your face and compared to their database. Um, so in those situations, um, it's very possible for you to be walking down the street and not be able to understand that your face has been captured, that you're part of this database, that your face has been compared to another database. Um, the level of interaction is often a lot lower. And the, the, the objective in those situations is not that of access, but that of surveillance. So um, it's the idea of, you know, tracking an individual's movement, um, like it was just discussed, you know, um, much more, you know, potentially um, dangerous situations that can easily be weaponized by whoever has, you know, control over the data of someone's uh, biometric information. I will um, note, a challenge that exists for both of these issues, at least in the US, is that um, the the way that these models are currently being developed, uh, by the way, there's also this sort of third category of facial recognition products, um, which is sort of facial analysis products. So these are products that you might have seen where they attempt to characterize the face in some way. So they'll try to you know guess your age or your emotion or your gender or your ethnicity based off of your face. Um, and those are that's sort of this third category of products to consider as well that's becoming increasingly popular. Um, but I was going to mention in the U.S., all three of these categories have this challenge where the current uh, technique of 
uh, you know, engineering these tools um, uh, involves, you know, one large, large, a large amount of data. So, you know, often to make any of these tools work effectively, um, there's sort of this incredible data requirement that leads to, um, you know, those training and uh, deploying these systems to hoard biometric information about people, which automatically sort of puts them at risk <laughs> in very yeah. serious ways. Um, you know, um, a face is, is as identifiable or unique to an individual as a fingerprint. So, um, you know, we don't upload our fingerprint to the internet for reasons. <laughs> we understand that that's information that's very sensitive. And um, if that was to get into the wrong hands, that could be very difficult for us to, to, to navigate. Whereas with our face, we're, you know, we're very casual about our face. We upload it everywhere, um, but it's just as uh, sensitive uh, biometric information as, you know, a fingerprint or uh, a blood sample. So it becomes very dangerous um, in these situations where these companies, you know, collect lots and lots of biometric information about people to build any of these tools. So I'm, I'm wary of framing, you know, um, face identification as the, you know, the, the lesser of two evils, because it it also does encourage companies to collect this biometric information. And um, I have personally dealt with at least one case um, in when I was in New York, um, there was a, um, a tenant building where um, the landlord who sort of had a history of harassing the tenants. So the tenants were mostly people of color, lower income individuals, and the tenant, the landlord was sort of looking, it was a rent stabilized building and the landlord was sort of looking for ways to kick the tenants out so he could raise the rent. Um, and one of the strategies he had come up with was installing a facial recognition system to identify tenants as they were coming in and out. And um, the initial pitch was as an access point. So to say, you know, for security reasons, we want to collect your biometric information so that, you know, you, we can match it to, uh, you know, the faces in our database and so that you can have access into the building. Um, but very quickly, um, the tenants realized that that could escalate to the point of surveillance where once he had their biometric information, he could use that same information to track them throughout the building. Um, and that, that, that case really escalated. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we were involved um, in a campaign um, that it escalated to the point of um, having uh, one of the, represent the, the House of Representatives uh, members from that area actually propose an act called the Biometric Barriers Act that was aiming to um, block facial recognition deployment of any kind in rent stabilized buildings since it was be beginning to it was beginning to be weaponized by landlords as a way of collecting you know the sensitive information about their residents you know under the guise of access but really for this purpose of surveillance um so i'm i'm very wary of that of making that difference feel like one is the lesser of two evils um and then the second sort of reason i'm very wary of that distinction you know uh, presenting, you know, face identification as the lesser of two evils here um, is because, you know, another part of my research is auditing a lot of these deployed facial recognition systems. Um, and our audit work has revealed that, uh, you know, facial recognition systems often do not work as well for people of color as they do for um, other individuals. And as a result of that, you have a situation where, um, whether it's a face identification system or, um, a facial recognition system or even a face analysis system, so something trying to detect emotions, um, often it will not detect the face of a person of color or properly, or give the correct response for a person of color. So, you know, for the case that you were mentioning with um, face identification or with the application of access where you're, you know, you're just trying to get into your iPhone. And there was a, a, a situation of this with um, Chinese users of the iPhone once Face ID was released. Um, you know, Chinese users were often complaining about the fact that the iPhone was not very effective on their face. Um, there was uh, an Uber driver that had sued because Uber's, um, you know, driver facing app um, in the U.S. in San Francisco, I believe, used a facial recognition system to verify your identity before, you know, um, giving you access into the app. Um, and as a result of that, you know, because it wouldn't identify his face, he wasn't able to work for, for several weeks before that was resolved. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, negative consequences that can happen as a result of even facial recognition being used for, you know, access into your phone and that not working. Um, in the case of uh, the Chinese users of the Face ID uh, app, uh, sort of tool for the iPhone, uh, you know, you would have a situation where, you know, their cousin or their sister was able to unlock their iPhone. And that's obviously 
an incredible security risk. So, um, you know, all of this to say, and and by the way, you know, all of this is definitely, all these risks definitely also exist for, um, you know, surveillance applications as well. Um, you know, we have uh, in the US uh, a couple cases, um, Robert Williams being sort of the most prominently featured case of a man that was falsely identified uh, using a facial recognition tool. And, you know, since the goal of that tool was surveillance, um, uh, it escalated to a false arrest, which was obviously very personally disruptive. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of situations um, where, you know, things can easily uh, spiral out of control. And I think that facial recognition of any form should really be um, analyzed and investigated. There's a lot of opportunity for this tool to really, you um, one, operate as an excuse um, uh, to collect biometric information, and then two, um, you know, put people at risk by virtue of the application not functioning for them because they're part of an underrepresented group. Um, so yeah, all this to say that there's a difference between the two of them, but um, I'm wary of presenting one as sort of the lesser of the two evils. All right, thank you so much um, for this clarification. Um, so um, I will now move over to Lotte. Um, you work for Bits of Freedom in the Netherlands and an important part of your work is the work on the biometric surveillance technology. And recently the Citizens Initiative Reclaim Your Face, which was already mentioned before, uh, was registered by the Commission. So congratulations on that. Um, what are the different privacy concerns you see and how are the specific privacy concerns different for facial recognition te technology compared to facial authentication? Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, for the introduction and the, the congrats. <laughs> um, I want to start with uh, agreeing with, with Deb that um, this, this difference uh, that's normally sketched between the risks of facial recognition as surveillance and facial authentication as kind of a security method um, are mostly overstated because I think there are some links that are sometimes missing when people make the difference um, and then it seems to be smaller. Um, but to, to answer your question and what in our perspective are some differences is that it's also sometimes about who's asking the question. If you have, for example, uh, facial authentication as a security method for a building or for unlocking your phone, it can be a measure of securing, for example, the data that is on the phone or securing um, high security level building. Um, and then it's only a limited amount of people that can get in, you for your phone or people that are working in the building. Um, most of the time they know that uh, the system is there uh, they gave consent. This is a bit dubious because sometimes there's power relations there or they don't have other options, but it can happen in a good way and at least there is a difference in situation. Um, and it can be that the system is used also in, in their interest because the security measure can protect something that is theirs, um, which is a difference when you look, for example, at facial recognition as uh, mass surveillance in public space where we see that a lot of people are, they don't know that it's happening. Um, and the surveillance that takes place, since they don't know, they are not even able to give consent. And also since it's most of the time not per se ha happening in their interests, um, they might not even want to give consent. So I think there is a really big interest in the question um, in whose interest is the deployment of this technology and who wants to know your identification or who wants to verify it and because of what goals and whose interest. Thank you. Um, Nakima, you're an expert on the effects of facial recognition on marginalized communities. Um, which problems do you see if facial recognition is deployed specifically in the public space? And why are those risks different than the risk for facial authentication technologies? I think um, to follow on a bit on what both Lotte and Deb were saying, um, the biggest problem that I see initially with uh, facial recognition as deployed in public spaces is uh, first the assumption of criminality uh, because the uses that we're hearing about are all about following, tracking, uh, limiting and um, catching up with criminals essentially and criminal behavior 
Um, and there's another assumption that's equally jarring for me, um, which is the assumption of the infallibility of the software that's being used. So it's not only a question of capturing images and making matches between um, the images that have been given of people's biometric identifiers um, willingly or unwillingly uh, to the authorities. It's also the assumption that whatever software is being used to match those images to a database of faces is going to be utilized in the correct way. What do I mean by that? Um, I think Simon mentioned earlier that there was something like a rumor of 10 specific um, physi physiological points that were being used to match faces to a database of faces um, in the Serbian case. Well, who is in fact available to ensure that all 10 of those points are being matched by the authorities who are then attempting to identify people with criminal behavior, with suspected criminal behavior using those 10 identifying points. Um, we've had examples again from the US, but there are others um, where the authorities, the uh, law enforcement in particular has been shown to be using specific facial recognition software um, incorrectly, which is to say with a range of different uh, data points that can be matched to a database of faces, they're using 30%, they're using 20%, uh, and they're using that 20% match, 30% match, whatever it is, um, to then go out and uh, prosecute people or attempt to apprehend them and engage them further into the legal system without their consent, without, in many cases, any wrongdoing at all. Um, so I think that's a very big difference than um, facial authentication in the case of an iPhone or in the case of you know, accessing a particular door or particular access point to a specific space. Thank you. Um, so I think we now have kind of an idea what the difference of the technologies used are. Um, but if you still have any question about this topic, then um, don't hesitate to um, ask the questions in the chat on uh, YouTube or Facebook or Twitter. We're everywhere today. Um, and I also heard that there were some issues with the, the chat box on YouTube. Apparently, if you refresh the page, then the chat box will, uh, will magically appear. So um, that's good to know. So um, we're now moving on to the second part of the, of the discussion. Um, we will look into how biometric surveillance is being already implemented and what the specific risks are. Um, during the last event that we already did uh, 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 around the topic of biometric mass surveillance, we um, heard that the very first areas where facial recognition is tested or used are usually uh, the more disadvantaged neighborhoods. So um, to perhaps start with you, Nakima, um, where and in how far and to what extent is facial recognition being deployed and what could be the effects in the long term on citizens' fundamental rights? Um, I think you've already sort of outlined uh, what the initial usage uh, typically is for facial recognition, facial surveillance. It's on um, controlling or attempting to gain um, information willingly given or not about marginalized groups and communities specifically that are underrepresented um, in government and in law enforcement. And in the case of um, communities of uh, asylum seekers, refugees in Greece, um, and in other locations where um, the persons concerned may not have full access to um, the law, they may not have um, protection against surveillance. Um, we're seeing that these techno this technology in particular is being used as a way to um, quickly control and try to um, bar access to certain places and to certain services um, amongst uh, populations that have fewer bargaining rights. Um, you're also seeing a lot more over-policed environments. This is in North America, this is also in China, um, where you have minority populations that may have historically uh, suffered from discrimination um, being targeted for additional surveillance on the basis of um, some type of assumption of public safety being served or furthered by 
targeting. And I think it's um, targeting these communities and these individuals um, without their consent. Uh, again, the assumption of criminality is, is rife and the assumption that there is always um, a basis, a legal basis for um, victimizing and violating the privacy of certain communities uh, for the greater good and for the public good um, is usually the argument that's made. Yeah, and um, yeah, just to, to go a bit further onto this point of controlling and disadvantaging minorities, that um, your audit facial recognition systems um, found that these systems do not recognize uh, black women, and your findings even led big industry players to self-impose a moratorium on facial recognition. So what risks do you see if facial recognition is deployed in a public space? And um, is it even possible to ensure accountability? Yeah, I was um, I think um, the 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 idea sort of of a, a self-imposed moratorium, it, it was uh, it was sort of there was a lot of public pressure, I think, that went into <laughs> into that decision. Um, there were a lot of early interactions we had with all of those companies where they were not eager <laughs> um, to stop selling that technology, even though, um, like was mentioned by others, you know, there's definitely functional issues in addition to um, human rights issues um, in, involved with the deployment of that tool. Um, yeah, so um, I I think that there's um, a lot of interesting, uh, well, I think the, the main sort of challenge that, or the, the main sort of cause that, at least in the US, a lot of the um, progress has been made on, and this has been in collaboration with um, ACLU, especially ACLU Massachusetts, that has been campaigning about this um, with us for about two years now. <laughs> um, so it's been a very long fight. But I think the, the main concern that we have is that around police use of facial recognition or the police use of face surveillance specifically. Um, so, um, you know, facial recognition, like I mentioned, is um, a broadly understood technology. It encompasses, you know, face verification or face identification. Um, it encompasses, you know, face analysis, like I mentioned, in a lot of commercial tools. Um, but the police use of these tools is really where um, that translates to material violence in the lives of a lot of underrepresented folks, especially where, um, you know, police will use uh, a facial recognition match uh, as sort of uh, uh, legal collateral um, to, you know, continue acting in a way that could be discriminatory. We see a similar sort of pattern with predictive policing tools in the US where, um, you know, police department might sort of be um, intent on, uh, or may, might have a pattern of harassing a particular um, underrepresented neighborhood or population. Um, and, you know, facial recognition or predictive pol or the predictive policing tool is really just uh, an excuse for them to continue with that behavior. Um, uh, something they can point to as evidence for why they're acting in a particular way. So in, in that way, it directly puts these populations at risk because not only are they the group that we've discovered, um, you know, these tools work the least effectively for, but they're also the tool, they're, they're also the population most vulnerable to having, you know, that false match escalate to the point of an arrest, um, you know, versus another person that might be caught in a similar situation. Um, so as a result of that, it really does put uh, minority populations at, at, a, at a huge sort of physical risk um, um, when these tools are widely deployed. Um, the other thing that um, um, happened in the U.S., um, in Detroit especially, um, and this is due to a lot of the advocacy work of um, um, people like Tawana Petty, where um, in Detroit there's also been this sort of uh, push in minority neighborhoods where there's this, you know, this narrative around crime and criminalization um, uh, in those neighborhoods. And as a result of that, you will have a situation where um, it's not just in public spaces, but also private spaces. So they have um, in Detroit the Green Light Project, where uh, the police has actually partnered with um, you know particular private enterprises. So you know can, you can think of like a mall with uh, security cameras in inside or um, you know in their parking lot, um, and actually giving police access to those cameras on private property. Um, uh, you know to to be able to process that information. And then with Amazon, um, I'm not sure if 
this is going to be a familiar example, but Amazon Ring um, is sort of this doorbell, yeah, that you can sort of purchase, and it's a camera um, and it monitors your porch, ideally. Um, but um, there's been a couple instances, and Amazon is, you know, despite their moratorium that um, they had put forth around um, pausing facial recognition, their face, the, the, the sale of their facial recognition product directly to police. Um, you know, there's been a couple recent investigations discovering that they continue to try to leverage their ring product um, through partnerships with law enforcement and using their facial recognition tool as, you know, an option for how to process that data. So, um, you know, this is a situation where it's technically not, um, you know, a camera um, in a public space. Um, it's actually a privately owned camera. Um, but even, you know, allowing these public private partnerships with law enforcement and allowing facial recognition to be part of that equation in terms of how to process that data um, can result to, in a lot of harm as well. So um, lots of different ways that that risk can actually practically play out. Yes. Um, so yeah, hearing from uh, Nakima and Deb, uh, there's there's a huge risk of disadvantaging minorities because they're already targeted more often, and you know we have this huge risk of false positives. Um, but there's also another side to it. Uh, Lotte, you have mentioned that the more powerful and less flawed and biased these technologies become, the more danger dangerous they become. Um, could you perhaps explain this and how far can facial recognition enlarge the power imbalance between citizens and the government and where will it stop? Yes. Um... Well, what, what we see was that in the, in the beginning of the debate, um, one large disadvantage or, or argument against uh, face surveillance was these false positives. And people, uh, at least in the discussion in the Netherlands, put a lot to the front that there were a lot of false positives because of uh, the bias in the algorithms and in the data that they are trained with. Um, uh oh, I'm getting a power problem right here. Um, so there we said, it's not only the problem that there may be technological deficiencies and that you get false positives, because if the technology would work equally well on everybody, this will definitely not mean it works equally well for everybody. And that's exactly because of this deployment might be larger in certain areas, or it's used by, for example, law enforcement that uh, might do racial profiling. And if you put uh, a force like facial recognition on that, um, then it might work, but it might be even dangerous. I think there's several or there's different dangers when you look at one side, the false positives, and other hand, um, technology that is even more powerful because it works and that might be dangerous in another way. Can, can you maybe give me a minute because I'm afraid my laptop will yes. die. We will. I'll ask a question to someone else, and you can you can fix your technology. Oh, Nakima, do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I think it's good that we focus on the idea that the um, the groups that are most likely to be victimized are initially the ones on whom, um, coincidentally, that the software technology tends to work least well, um, but also that. Um, this is a very much uh, an open door. Biometric surveillance is very much an open door to all kinds of surveillance that may uh, start off as being um, racial groups or neighborhood-based or um, undesirables in some way that for some reason are more su suspect of wrongdoing of some type of non-conformity. But it's a, it's a very, very quick hop from that to targeting members of other groups that for whatever reason um, merit or are argued to merit increased surveillance. Um, it's uh, really a deterrent to any type of nonconformity, whether that be um, gender identification, whether that be um, any type of identity, personally identifiable characteristics that, um, as I think um, was mentioned earlier, are part of this increasing suite of services and analysis that apparently um, certain private um, companies and interests are purporting can be made from the same facial um, surveillance techniques. So you're not only talking about one to many matches with your face against a database that has been collected who knows how, you're now talking about the possibility that characteristics 
um, such as trustworthiness. You know, this was something that was most recently um, revealed to be some companies' business um, proposal, presumably going to companies and to law enforcement um, to sell that product. And it goes on from there, gender, it goes on for all kinds of identification that apparently can be um, certain companies are proposing derived from facial recognition technologies and their computer vision algorithm is so great that this is a whatever percentage of confidence. Um, the breadth of communities that it's tested on, uh, the likelihood that it actually does not work well for many communities, genders, et cetera, no one is talking about that and that's what needs to be kept at the forefront i think when we're talking about human rights and the right to privacy yes thank you um deborah you also wanted to respond quickly oh yeah i just had a very quick response which is um um yeah i love that uh point and i totally agree with it that um you know facial recognition can be very dangerous when it doesn't work um but it can also be very very dangerous when it when it does work um, and um, this is actually one of those situations where the difference between, you know, face verification, one-to-one -one matching and, um, you know, surveillance applications and, you know, facial recognition in the technical sense um, becomes very clear because uh, with, you know, one-to-one -one matching with respect to my iPhone, a lot of the harm happens when it doesn't work, when it can't identify my face and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I can't get into my phone or I can't get into whatever building. You know, the main issue in those situations is functionality. Um, and, um, you know, uh, you know, people at Apple, for example, are very focused on that um, bias problem because that's that's really their main challenge. Um, in addition to sort of encryption and keeping the data private, uh, a lot of the downside um, to a person of color interacting with that product is that it won't work for them. Whereas with surveillance, um, you know, uh, definitely the dysfunctionality is a huge challenge. If I get misidentified, as the case with Robert Williams, you know, that escalates to arrest at a rate that that wouldn't happen for anyone else. So it's a true danger that it doesn't work for someone like Robert Williams. Um, but also, you know, there's all sorts of other issues, um, specifically privacy issues, consent issues that arise with um, facial recognition and with face surveillance, specifically that might not, um, you know, that, that might be um, um, sort of bigger issues than, than in the, the situation of, um, of access. So I, I think that, uh, definitely worth discussing that a little bit. The fact that um, you know, even when it does work, uh, especially in the surveillance case, uh, it, it, it's still incredibly problematic as a technology. Yeah. Can I and add then, a small thing to that? Of or, course. Well, I think one thing we have to keep in mind is that a lot of surveillance technologies, their aim is to kind of sort people. It's it's a part of of surveillance to well, socially or in other ways, sort people. And especially when profiling uh, comes into the mix, uh, we see that, for example, we had this um, European project, I think it's part of Horizon 2020, which is called Eye Border Control, um, where they used uh, facial analysis. Um, and it's a, it was a border project. So normally when you come at customs, you, ask some, you answer some questions like, what's your name, uh, where are you going to, what are you gonna do there? Um, and they technologically analyzed your face and the small muscles that are moving in your face to give you a score of how much they think you are trustworthy. Um, and then they gave you a score. And when you had a high score, for example, you had to had you went through a different regime than when you had a low score based on the risk they assigned to that. So I think what we have to keep in mind is that surveillance is about gathering information about people um, and based on that information, a different regime applies to you. So I think there's discrimination in there per definition. All right, and uh, perhaps uh, as a last question um, uh, uh, to, the, to the panel before we move over to the commission, what kind of regulations do we do we need to protect the privacy and human rights of citizens? It's just a small question, I know, but uh, I would like to, <laughs> to give uh, give the opportunity to uh, to our panelists to to give a, sh a short answer uh, or try to do so. Who would like to go first? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is this is one of our great goals with the Reclaim Your Face campaign. Um, we think uh, we really need a total ban on uh, biometric surveillance technology in public spaces. 
um, we don't believe that with strict regulation we will get there because we are afraid that we will not be able to contain the use or deployment of uh, biometric surveillance. We also don't believe a moratorium will be enough because one of the problems this will cause is that it, the most thing it, it will result in is time. Um, time in which lobbyists can uh, put out their words uh, and put pressure on, on politics and then we get the same, it might be just expanded and that we don't are that we're not able to defend our human rights but also to defend our public spaces and I think the public spaces play a really crucial part in a free democracy because it is the places where we uh, act out our fundamental rights, where people go to to protest, where people meet each other, where people walk, walk by to their sacred places, where people um, live as communities. Um, this is no place for state interference in a sense that you that they that the state will be able to monitor, analyze, and track everybody in there. Um, so when it comes to the protection of um, or data or fundamental rights and or free societies, I think the only answer is a total ban of biometric surveillance in public spaces. All right. Um, any other? Deborah, Nakima? I'm, I'm happy to add quickly that um, as somebody who has grown up in an over-policed uh, community that um, has the personal experience of um, seeking to avoid certain public spaces, public services, public uh, situations where the assumption that I had growing up was that I would be subject to this particularly harsh surveillance um, technique of uh, intimidation, of ex extra um, uh, concern and care uh, just at being present. Um, this is an incredibly um, dangerous and invasive and uh, harmful technology to be even considering uh, in terms of moratorium, you know, maybe maybe later, maybe a little later, um, there should absolutely be a total ban. That's why Amnesty has just, I think, released their request for that in New York City, where I grew up. Um, that's why uh, Boston and other cities have gone so far as to enforce a total ban because they recognize that they have no control over how this technology and the surveillance will be implemented and that more likely than not, it will be um, unevenly and disproportionately harmful to marginalized communities. And that's just the precedent of um, the technology thus far. So I'm, I'm in a total ban camp as well. And I saw Deborah uh, nodding. Yeah, that was very well said. Yeah, I, I think that was a lot of the reasoning why I'm also um, in a total ban um, sort of uh, position. And it took me actually a while to get there. I think I started off in a position of um, being against police use of face surveillance and a lot of the um, um, a lot of the sort of mandates that you see from municipal city, like municipal governments and um, even some statewide wide proposals in the U.S. are mostly focused on that. Um, application of you know police use of face surveillance and banning that particular uh, use case of, of facial recognition, um, but as we've had a couple you know uh, you mentioned Boston, but Berkeley and other you know Cambridge, other other cities throughout the U.S. have begun um, Portland have begun um, you know banning police use of facial recognition, and I, I I'm actually I, I'm like watching in real time you know how all these police departments are creatively circumventing that. <laughs> that ban in, in various interesting ways, um, you know, sourcing information. And the other thing as well is that, you know, it's not just police use. Um, ICE, which is sort of the enforcement agency for immigration in the U.S., has been making increasing use of facial recognition, um, and they're not affected by a lot of these bans. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm watching how people are sourcing, um, you know, face data from, you know, driver, driver's license databases so that they're not storing the database. Um, or they're, you know, they're sending their their uh, leads to um, a department uh, in another city that does is not under ban, so that it can be processed. So in general, I, I kind of arrived at the conclusion that um, facial recognition as a technology is just incredibly, you know, by virtue of just um, requiring, you know, this hoarding or, or this access to, you know, copious amounts of, uh, you know, personal personally identifiable biometric data. It's just uh, by definition, a very dangerous tool. 
Um, and you know, bef before we can use it confidently, we need to actually um, you know fully restrict uh, uh, the way that we deploy this. Um, the other thing I'll note as well is that people often talk about you know face ID on your phone. Um, a lot of the uh, municipal bans in the U.S. will have a clause, um, you know, excusing that kind of application of facial recognition for access purposes. Um, and I'm actually increasingly against that as well. Um, I'm noticing, um, you know, first of all, I, I'm now of the camp that um, there's probably another way to uh, to to uh, design that kind of security feature. So, you know, some, even something like a fingerprint requires more interaction than something like, and is a more reliable um, biometric than something like the face. The face is actually a very sort of dangerous biometric to work with in a lot of ways. Um, so I'm, I'm actually, you know, shifting myself <laughs> towards a, a very like a full absolute ban mode. Um, uh, uh, I haven't made up my mind yet, but, um, you know, the Algorithmic Justice League as an organization is definitely in the camp of, you know, banning police use of face surveillance. And me personally, I'm kind of shifting towards um, uh, a more absolute ban of the tool until we can really um, understand um, if there's any sort of justification for that hoarding of biometric info. Thank you. I see that Nakima would really like to respond um, very shortly, please, because uh, briefly, please, because then we move over Thank to the we're already over time. I just wanted to say that, again, the, the idea that there's still a debate in terms of moratorium versus ban is often very much uh, framed, at least in the European context, with um, the target populations and risks that those populations uh, represent in terms of it not being used on the sort of general public. Um, there's definitely word that uh, in France, for instance, um, the database that they were excited to roll out for facial recognition and surveillance purposes was not going to be used on the French, it was going to be used on immigrants. So, you know, the French need not worry. And, you know, in, in the US, you have many cases where all manner of abuses in terms of surveillance are going to be used on illegals, um, so aliens or others, or not the general population. So the general population need not fear. But again, I think again, we have to keep in mind that historically, these these fringe or these less protected uh, communities and individuals are a representation of the power of the state and law enforcement. And once that door is opened, it, there's no telling how far it goes, and it cannot be closed. So. Thank you. Um, then I would really like now to, to move over to um, Irina Orsic. We're very honored that you're here and um, she will give a, a reflection on what she heard in the debate and also explain a bit more on what the Commission is doing around this topic. Um, she's a team leader for AI policy in AI policy development and coordination at the European Commission. So thank you so much for joining us today. Oh. We don't hear you, I think. Oh no. Mm. No. Perhaps if you mute and unmute yourself or Let's see. No. Okay, um, I will ask the technician to give you a, a phone call and to see what's going on. And then we'll just shift the program a bit and we now move over to the Q&A. Uh, I'm very sorry about this. Um, so um, yes, we'll try to, to fix uh, the situation. Um, so then um, it's now time to uh, to go to the Q&A. Um, we, um, we got quite some questions in the chat, so that's very nice. Um, and uh, I will ask some, and uh, please just show your, raise your hand if you, um, uh, then uh, if you raise your hand if you want to respond uh, to the questions. So, um, first question: We see the rise of facial recognition surveillance coincide with increasing bans on face covering clothing in public spaces. Um, should we also be concerned about face covering bans at this point? No one wants to answer this question. Wait, sorry, the question was, should we also be concerned about what? Um, so uh, someone asked if we should also be concerned about face covering bans at this point. Oh. Face covering bans. Yeah, this, oh, go ahead. Yes, Simon wants to respond. 
No, you can also go ahead. I just had a small, I mean, okay, I quickly, just <laughs> remind that part of the, the campaign in Belgrade uh, was also to give out um, Corona masks, you know, um, for the, the 1000 camera Belgrade campaign, uh, because basically uh, in Belgrade, but that's another story, but you have three reasons to wear uh, a mask. Basically one is air pollution, the other one is uh, facial recognition, um, <laughs> and then, um, and then the, the third one is Corona, of course. So, so that just came came to mind. But I guess what what is meant is also the uh, increasing uh, discussions on banning um, face veiling um, when it comes to demonstrators and um, and uh, a niqab, basically. Um, so um, traditional um, Muslim um, co coverings, which is a big discussion in France, I know, and. Uh, and also in other European countries, um, which is very often an infringement to uh, the freedom to religion and conscience. So um, difficult dis discussion. Um, I didn't didn't yet connect the two discussions, to be honest. I'll add a comment there because I think the um, discussion about face coverings is a, is also tricky in that. Uh, yes, in the French, in the Belgian, in, in many contexts, uh, it is linked to um, wearing of religious uh, garments, uh, such as the niqab. But it's also, um, in the last year or two, it's been very much a part of the Hong Kong and other protests against authoritarian governments um, in an effort to sort of protect one's privacy um, and one's ability to demonstrate against such governments, knowing that those uh, governments were already working with law enforcement to deploy surveillance technology that would target and criminalize um, participants who were organizing um, demonstrations. So it's it's hard to say um, what that ban is is for, or what type of banning, what type of face covering would be banned. Would it be okay to cover your face for corona purposes, but not if you're at a demonstration in the public area, in the public space, uh, you know, this is this is why it becomes a quite interesting question. Yeah, I just had a quick like technical sort of like appendix to that, which is, um, you know, National Institute of Standards and Technology did like a uh, audit on um, a lot of the mainstream facial recognition tools being used by the US government and found that a lot of them, you know, really broke down in the presence of a mask, um, which obviously, uh, made things difficult in the coronavirus period. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, uh, for, you know, for worse, uh, probably, um, um, a lot of uh, tech companies kind of jumped on that opportunity to attempt to develop new strategies to identify people in the absence of, uh, you know, information about their nose and their mouth area. So there's, um, you know, at the recent uh, sort of uh, computer vision conference I went to, there was, you know, one of the highly anticipated papers in that space was, you know, a, a paper that was able to identify people just based off of, you know, their eye area and their forehead and their hair. So, um, you know, there's definitely um, advances to the technology that are aware of that limitation and people actively trying to circumvent it. Wow, so people can recognize this now based on our foreheads. That's fascinating <laughs> and very scary. Um, I think are you working again, uh, your mic? Can we have a um, check? I hope so. Can you hear yes, me this time? Yes, we hear you. Okay. All right. Um, so I will um, uh, move on a little bit more with the Q&A, and I'll give you the floor. Um, Lotte, you wanted to respond? Yes. Um, one of the things that, that happened in this development that that also sketched was that uh, some researchers uh, put together a database with uh, pictures that they scraped, I think, from Facebook um there were a few thousands in there because of course now a lot of people are wearing face coverage because they're wearing um corona protection so there's a lot of pictures of people wearing face coverage ended up on so social media uh, such as facebook so they scraped them off there put together a database with only people that are uh that has their faces covered um so then you have your trainings database to adjust your facial recognition algorithms and train them to um recognize people that have their face covered so mm -hmm. that happens already all right um another question we got from the audience um why is it important to talk about consent when we're talking about uh, facial recognition in public who would like to go first on that 
Don't be shy. Lotta, you wanna go? You can go. <laughs> yeah, I want to go, and then I'm like, oh no, but I'm also the last person who said something. And then no, that's, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, we don't mind. Um, yeah, and the other thing is that I think it's really dubious um, to talk about consent when it comes to uh, surveillance in public spaces in general, because um, it's practically impossible, um, because consent should always be freely given and informed. And I think you have two problems there. Um, what you see now is that a lot of, especially biometric surveillance pilots that are now happening in public space, um, there is not much transparency about that. So people are not informed when they're in the spaces where this happens. Um, you cannot consent to something that you don't know about. That's quite simple. And the other thing is that it should be freely given. Uh, and you cannot, there's no opt out option from public space because that means an opt out option from society. So you cannot ask people like, hey, we're doing uh, facial surveillance at this square. Please don't come to the square anymore if you don't want your biometric data process. That's, that's not how a free society works. Um, and you cannot, there is no consent if it's not informed or not freely given. So I, I don't see how this could work in, in practice. Yeah, I have uh, something very quick to add to that, which is um, uh, I think um, that that was a great response, especially with respect to sort of um, face surveillance, um, you know, uh, sort of anchored to like physical uh, surveillance infrastructure. But there's also, um, you know, situations, a lot of the uh, scandals um, uh, by American companies um, on um, issues of, you know, collecting face data without um, any kind of approval or consent is also based off of, you know, uh, digital surveillance applications for some of these things and, you know, digital surveillance infrastructure. So when I upload my picture to Flickr or to a dating website or uh, to Facebook, I don't expect <laughs> that face to end up in, uh, you know, uh, a face a facial recognition you know training set and I don't expect that information to be used against me or just to be sold to the police um similar to what I was mentioning around sometimes you know um, you'll have your face taken for a driver's license and uh you know be used by police to in some other application so um, there's a lot of instances of that that we're seeing and like I mentioned again you know this is a very sensitive very sensitive biometric data um consent requires information and, and an informed stance on what that information is going to be used for and how it's going to be used thank you all right um then i want to really uh, thank the audience for asking these questions and i will now really give the floor to uh Irina from the commission Please go I hope my mic still works. Yes, it is. <laughs> Super. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, this was very interesting. Um, so the first thing I can tell you from the perspective of the European Commission is that nothing is yet decided. We have all the options on the table. Um, and then indeed the next question is what are the options? You will be aware that in February last year, we had published a white paper on artificial intelligence. Also that in versions which had been floating around before, there was talk about a ban and the adoption of the, the final version which adopted in February was not talking about a ban, but was opening a specific discussion not only on facial recognition, but on biometric identification technologies in general. Um, so um, there were a number of proposals and there was a public consultation between February and June last year. And the results of this public consultation when it comes to biometrics were pretty clear. We had 1,215 respondents, out of which 28% were for a ban. So this is pretty close to this discussion. 29% um, were for some suspension of um, all the biometric identification running in public spaces until there were good rules in place. And another 20% said that anyway it should only be employed in very special cases. Then there were only 6% giving us a simple go ahead like do what you want, um, 
have, uh, have the technologies running. Um, but there were also what is an interesting one and a high value, 17% without an opinion. So we had this public consultation. We had since then also plenty of discussions. And um, like one option is always to have a ban. Um, but um, then I would stop talking now, which would be a bit boring for me. So I tell you a bit about the other options. Um, the one which we had proposed in the white paper is, um, and we had proposed that for artificial intelligence in general, um, but also for biometric identification um, in particular, is um, to have certain requirements on the system before putting the system in the European market. So um, those requirements would, for example, relate to the training data, um, to um, how it was trained, how the algorithm was done. Um, it was then about the information to be provided to users. It was very much about robustness and accuracy of the systems and also about human oversight. So what these criteria and these requirements actually would be checked with an ex ante conformity assessment. So before any system could go on the market, it would really have to be tested on this criteria. Now, this is when we look at what we discussed before relating to the reliability of the software, the reliability of the system. So this is how one would make sure that um, certain, certain groups of the population are not discriminated, that one would minimize, if not to, hopefully to zero, the false negatives, false positives. So all this would be part of this first risk assessment, conformity assessment. Now, this is the first step. This is what we had proposed. But then we had also proposed to have a specific discussion about what else is needed. So this what else is needed relates to what was discussed before, um, like under which circumstances, even if a system is wonderful, accurate, and perfect, under which circumstances can you run it? And this is the second part of the discussions. And that's the question. So, one thing we do have in Europe is the data protection archive. And this is also why we felt it's less urgent to go for a ban before having a public discussion on it than in the US, because there are already many rules in place. But still, there is the question, what else is needed? So on top of the data protection rules, where you said, OK, consent is not really realistic, and how does this work? What could we do? Um, so for example, would it be possible really that, and we have to balance probably some security interests to really make it possible only to run this system um, subject to an individual authorization decision with very clear criteria. In which cases can you run it? Could you, for example, try to restrict the duration and also the places um, that you say, OK, it might be on some places, but not in, on others, and it cannot be 24 hours a day. Um, can, you, um, can you restrict the question, well, the purpose anyway, so that you say this is like really only in case of terrorism and murder, and I don't know what. So there are all kinds of questions we are asking ourselves how we can, could perhaps um, balance the different interests. Again, nothing is decided, so it's all still on the table. Um, and um, um, how could this work in a way where everybody feels comfortable, where there is no chilling effect on our democracy, because we don't have the feeling that we are in a surveillance state, and where we really make sure that there is not a specific focus on marginalized communities. So these are the discussions. And um, I think um, for the rest, I would leave it to you and your questions. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Irina. Um, yeah, I, I uh, see a question here. Um, 
Do you think, um, uh, is the Commission considering to regulate um, face surveillance by law enforcement authorities, or is that beyond the scope? Sorry, I didn't get it. Face to... Is, is the Commission re considering to regulate face surveillance by law enforcement authorities, or is that beyond the scope? Um, no, as I, as I told you, nothing is decided, but this is also one of the things we are discussing. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think um, your response um, also made it very clear that we are st that we are we are having a very timely discussion today. Everything is still on the table. Um, we heard from people um, from with all different kinds of backgrounds um, who uh, all think a ban should be the right way forward. Um, it's also the position of the Greens EFA group. Um, so um, we will continue um, making sure that uh, that the next time you do a perhaps more representative poll of the public, more people will be for a ban as well. And um, we uh, we will now um, go to the ending of this meeting. Thank you so much for the great uh, panelists and the attendees. I will now hand over to my colleague uh, Patrick Breyer, who will uh, give the closing remarks uh, of our webinar today. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, my name is Patrick Breyer. I'm a member of the European Parliament also and of the Greens Effort Group for the Pirate Party. And I coordinate our group's campaign to, to ban face surveillance. So today we discussed various dimensions of facial recognition and facial authentication technologies. And I now have the honor to, to give you a short summary of, of this event. But first of all, let me thank you, the panelists, uh, Lotte, Nakima, Deb, for their valuable contributions to, to this debate. And also many thanks to Simon for sharing with us um, uh, the information on the situation in Belgrade, where the biometric mass surveillance is already a living a reality. And thank you to Irina Orsic for sharing the Commission's view on, on this crucial issue. So we set off our discussion with a very concerning statement on the use of biometric surveillance technology in a country that is currently negotiating to become a member of the European Union. In Serbia's capital, Belgrade, the government is, is deploying uh, video surveillance technology and setting up the technology for mass surveillance um, through facial recognition technology. And Simon's statement not only made us aware of the unprecedented scale of facial recognition as a means of, of mass surveillance, but also demonstrated how these technologies really impede on citizens' everyday freedom of expression in, in public space. Under constant surveillance, people have become more and more hesitant to voice their opinions because um, they expect to be watched and, and possibly identified. And we heard that some people even refrained from taking part in political protests because of this um, surveillance system. Now, the case of Serbia from a European perspective certainly shows a dystopian glance into the what the future of the European Union might look like. And um, this is really a, a precedent um, for what might happen if we don't take action now. Afterwards, in our um, panel debate, we um, started by discussing the differences between uh, facial authentication and facial recognition technologies. Uh, we learned that a, a difference uh, can be that um, uh, can be awareness. So, um, with face authentication or verification, um, users are often aware. And this awareness is, is often provided by the interaction needed to, to gain access to a device or a building, for example. On the other, on the other side, using a remote facial recognition in public spaces means that our biometric data will be processed and stored surreptitiously without us having uh, knowledge of it. And um, that is, of course, a major difference. However, as Deb and, and Lottie pointed out, uh, we also heard that it's difficult to identify one of the two as the lesser evil. Both technologies collect uh, highly sensitive biometric data, and both technologies are uh, often come with a discriminatory bias, uh, for example, against non-white communities, and uh, produce many more false positives here. 
Um, also, even face, face verification, for example, when used at the entrances to buildings, can be used for surveillance and tracking people whenever they uh, um, uh, enter a building or, or leave it. And Nakima made us aware of the fact that um, this technology is by no means infallible, that it's often used to target already marginalized communities and places them under an assumption of criminality. And that, in fact, face surveillance acts as a deterrent to any type of non-conformity, she says. So um, it's not just a technological program. Facial recognition can be dangerous when it doesn't work, but it can be even more dangerous when it does work, as we've heard. Um, we then moved on uh, to um, uh, discussing the implications of the technology and uh, answer some, some questions from the viewers. And in response to, to our debate, uh, Irina Osic informed us about the Commission's approach to regulating these technologies. And she told us that nothing is yet decided. All options are still on the table. However, in the consultation on an AI paper um, put forward by the Commission, only 28% of the participants spoke out in favor of a ban. And indeed, as Kim said, uh, maybe we should have a representative poll to, to have more insight into the views of all citizens, um, even those that didn't participate in this consultation. Other than a ban, the Commission is considering the option to um, require an ex ante conformity assessment before such technologies are allowed on the European market to make them more secure and reliable and to reduce built in bias uh, when it comes to minorities. Uh, she said that she, she doesn't feel like we're living in a surveillance state and that um, the Commission does not want this technology to have a chilling effect on our societies or a discriminatory effect. So to sum it up, I believe that uh, this debate made one thing very clear. Um, biometric mass surveillance technologies are a point of no return for, for human rights in public spaces. They are Pandora's box on our rights to privacy, to non-discrimination, to freedom of expression, and to participate in protest freedom of assembly. Um, by experience, we know that once these technologies are in place, it will likely be impossible to get rid of them again. And that is why our political group wants to make sure that we stop these technologies from becoming a dystopian reality in our everyday lives. And that is why we call on the commission to propose a ban on the use of biometric technologies for mass surveillance in public spaces, particularly when used by, by state actors. And by the way, uh, next week, I will be in the Court of Justice in Luxembourg to contest the refusal of access to documents on the EU-funded iBorder control project that has been mentioned, which, which claims to be able to detect liars by using artificial intelligence reading your face while answering questions. And we'll see if we can um, get some, some insight and transparency into this um, voodoo technology, I should like to call it. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Uh, please, um, our viewers, stay tuned to our social media channels. Uh, we'll release, release our official campaign video on Thursday of this week, so on, on Data Protection Day. And we'll have further events coming up in the course of this year to raise awareness for the the danger of these technologies. And we're looking forward to welcoming you back for these events. Thank you very much for joining us.